Hello and welcome to my next video on photosynthesis. So what is photosynthesis? It is the process whereby light energy from the sun is transformed into chemical energy and used to synthesize large organic molecules such as glucose from inorganic substances which are carbon dioxide and water. The equation is 6 carbon dioxide plus 6 water plus light energy becomes glucose and 6 oxygen. And two definitions. Autotrophs, these are organisms which can use light or, pho or what we'll say is photo or chemical, which is chemo, energy and inorganic molecules to synthesize complex organic molecules. So photo autotroph is one that uses light. Chemo autotrophs are ones that use chemical energy. Heter now those are plants and bacteria. Heterotrophs, now these ingest and digest complex organic molecules to release the chemical energy stored in them. Now animals such as us, fungi and some other bacteria are heterotrophs. Now, why do we need photosynthesis? Not just so plants can live, but it gives all organisms a lot of important items. One, oxygen, as because oxygen is a waste product from photosynthesis, so it becomes released into the atmosphere and used for respiration. That's one thing. But also from respiration, you need glucose. Now, we can't create our own glucose, so we have to ingest and digest glucose from plants. So without plants, there'll be no glucose and very little oxygen, so we wouldn't be able to respire. Chloroplast. This is a chloroplast. So, it is a double membrane. On the outside, it's an envelope. You have the outer membrane the inner membrane. Now, this membrane, the space between it, the intermembral space, is about 10 to 20 nanometers. The whole chloroplast will be 2 to 10 micrometers long. Now, the outer membrane is permeable to many small ions. So this is the kind of chlorine sodium ions you'd use. And then the inner one is less permeable but has transport proteins embedded in it. It's then folded into lamellae, which are thin plates which are stacked up. And now this is where it gets quite confusing because different books say different things about what a file according to lamella is. Now this is this is a foolproof answer, so you can't lose marks on this. You have a phylicoid, that's a small one small little plate. Then you have a stack of them. A stack of phylicoid membranes is a granum. You have many granums, you have grana. And then you have membranes between different granum. And that is the intergranal lamellae. That's what I've seen will not lose you marks if you say that. So and there's also starch grains. Now, soon I'll teach you about two reactions which happen in chloroplasts, which is photosynthesis. You have the light dependent and light independent. Just to say now, the light dependent stage occurs on phylicoid membranes and the light independent stage occurs in the stroma. That's the M, you all considered it. The bit is in the phylicoids. The, this will have lots of different um, enzymes and proteins in it. So like, like cytoplasm is in a cell. Now, how is this chloroplast adapted for their role? How for its role? So we said the inner membrane has transport proteins. So that control the end, what can enter and exit the, between the cytoplasm and the stroma. You have the grana. Now, it's stacked up together. This provides a very large surface area. And as we know from AS biology, large surface area means more reactions can happen. So it's good. Now, in the phylicoid membranes, there are things called photosystems. These are photosynthetic pigments which are arranged together and allow maximum absorption of light energy. We'll just talk about that next. You have proteins embedded in the grana hold the photosystems in place. We said the stroma contains enzymes needed to catalyze reactions. The grana are surrounded by the stroma, so the products of the light dependent in the phylicoid membranes can go straight to the independent stage. And chloroplast can make some of the proteins that are needed for photosynthesis. 
Pigments. A photosynthetic pigment is a molecule that can absorb light energy. The energy part's very important. Now, all photosynthetic pigments can absorb a range of wavelengths in the visible spectrum. Some are absorbed and some are reflected. And generally, particularly with chlorophyll, the primary pigment, red and blue light is absorbed, green light is reflected. That's why you plants look green. So the chlorophyll is reflecting green light. Now, you have, if you look at the little diagram, a kind of funnel shape. So at the bottom, little rectangle, that's the reaction centre. That contains the primary pigment. That is chlorophyll. Now, on the way, you have accessory pigments. Now this can be carotene or xanthophyll. These are ones which, while they absorb light energy, they don't they can pass it on so it goes and goes down from accessory pigment to accessory pigment till it reaches the reaction center in a random way to what we call a random walk now carotenoids so that is the carotene and xanthophyll the accessory pigments they absorb blue light like most do but reflect yellow and orange so you know you just think carotene carrots orange makes sense now these pigments, what they are, is they are a long chain of hydrocarbons and then there's two differences between chlorophylls and the keratin carotenoids. The chlorophylls consist of the long hydrocarbon chain which we call a phytol chain and a porphyrin group. Now you think haemoglobin as a heme group, that's what this is in a pigment you have a porphyrin group now this is a kind of think think if you're looking at it there's a diagram in the book it's like you have one cross like a time sign and on top of that you looks like you have an addition sign that's kind of what it is and in the middle is magnesium now this for chemists as you know can release two electrons and become an mg2 plus ion that is quite important because when chlorophyll absorbs light energy the electrons will become excited will reach a new energy level and then two electrons are released now there are two forms of chlorophyll a you have p680 and p70 now this is due to what we wavelength they absorb each absorb red light, but slightly different peaks. So one is at 680 nanometers, one is at 700 nanometers. Now the 700 nanometers is right on the absolute far red section of the visible light spectrum. Now P680 is found in Photosystem 2. Now weirdly, that's the first one that's used. It's called Photosystem 2 because it was the first. It was the second one to be discovered. Photosystem 1. Is that was discovered first, surprisingly, but it's actually the second one used. So you have P680 in Photosystem 2, P700 in Photosystem 1. So if you think the higher wavelength of light, the larger wavelength, the 700, is in the first, the lower is in the second. So if you think first on top, the higher one on top. Now, also chlorophyll A, as we said, absorbs blue light of a wavelength around 450 nanometers. And there's also chlorophyll B, which absorbs wavelengths of around 500 nanometers and 640 nanometers. It appears bluey green. And then, as we said, the accessory pigments, they absorb light wavelengths that are not well absorbed by chlorophylls and pass the energy associated with that light to the chlorophyll A at the base of the photosystem. Now, it's quite important to mention light is, as I said, is the energy that's absorbed, not just, don't just say light. But light is made of particles called photons for any physicist. Um, if you haven't heard of this for people who don't do physics, waves, which you consider as you know, light waves, are actually have wave particle duality, which means that they have characteristics of both waves, so they can like reflect, as you know light does, but also particles. In particular, they have energy. They have 
So you have photons which carry energy, little particles and packages of light energy. That's all you need to know in terms of physics. It's just photons, light energy absorbed by these pigments. So now the reactions. Now I've used a number of different sources to compile this diagram, so it's not the same as in the book. You know, it's very similar, because they are essentially similar. Um, but this is, I think, for me anyway, it's quite good to draw your own diagram, a good way of showing it. So, step one, that's the H2O becomes 2E minus plus half O2 plus 2H plus. Now, also for any chemist, that's a nice half equation there. Quite a good thing to look at. See, this is, is this kind of thing where it absorbs all of different areas of science, biology, chemistry, and physics. So it's quite good to learn about it from all aspects, but we are, of course, biologists. So this is called photolysis or photolysis. Now this is the splitting of water using light. And this is the way it is written. H2O becomes 2E minus plus half O2 plus 2H plus. Really, it would be correct to be 2H2O becomes 4E minus plus O2 plus 4H plus. Again, that's more for chemists and biologists. It just, it might come, that's how it's written in the book. It's basically why I'm mentioning that. Now, what this does is it has, creates three different products. Two of them are used, one is waste. Oxygen, this is where the oxygen waste comes from. So half O2, that's a step two. Half O2 plus half O2 becomes O2 and it's released in the atmosphere through the stomata. Now, if you look at step three, that's PS2, that's photosystem two. I said the first one that's used. As we said, light energy is absorbed into photosystem two and the magnesium releases two electrons. Now, the magnesium can't just keep losing electrons, otherwise they'll run out of electrons. So, because there'll be many chlorophyll molecules and each one can only release two electron molecules, it wouldn't be able to release any more. So, two electrons are released from the photolysis of water and they go into photosystem two and replace the two lost electrons. So that's what the first bit is used for, two electrons. We'll come on to the two hydrogen, um, the protons later. So, the electrons released. They then go into electron acceptors at four, which go down an electron transport chain. The electron chain contains a series of electron carriers embedded in the thylakoid membranes. The electron car carriers are proteins that contain iron atoms. Now, as the electrons go down the electron transport chain, energy is released. This pumps protons across the thylakoid membrane into the thylakoid space where they accumulate. A proton gradient is formed across the thylakoid membrane and the protein, protons flow down their gradient through channels associated with ATP synthase enzymes. This flow of protons is called chemiosmosis. Right, now, that all can be sound quite confusing, so I'll try and explain that. Because um, just to get the wording right, I'm reading that little bit from the book in case you haven't guessed. So, energy occurs. And this isn't ATP energy. This is just energy released from electrons. So, protons become pumped from the stroma in because. The thylakoids are little plates, but they're not just a membrane. There'll be a membrane on one side, space membrane in a thylakoid. So the protons, now be two protons again, two electrons for two protons. Two electrons are pumped into the thylakoid space, and then this keeps happening, and you get a buildup of protons. Now, that means you get a high concentration of protons in the thylakoid, low concentration outside, so they will want to diffuse out because you've got a proton gradient. It's formed. Now, they are co-transported through these ATP synthase enzymes. So the protons go through the ATP synthase. This happens as well in mitochondrion respiration. So the H plus go through the ATP synthase and this causes ATP 
Oh, sure, that's a mistake in the book. Um, it's ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus inorganic phosphate, which is PI, to join together to form ATP. So that creates an ATP molecule. So, very simply, electrons give energy, hydrogen ions or protons go into the thylakoid space, will then diffuse out down their concentration gradient through ATP synthase molecules, which causes ADP plus PI to become ATP. Now it's the kinetic energy from the proton flow which is converted to chemical energy in the ATP molecules. And that is used later. Anyway, ADP then goes off. These two big arrows going to the sides of the page. They are going to the next stage of light independent. So, right. so that's the ATP formed. Now the electrons go down the electron transport chain into photosystem one. Because light energy hits photosystem one and releases two electrons from the magnesium ion. So it's important, light hits, electrons are released, and then the other electrons are added in, replaced. You can't have more electrons in before they've been released. So light energy hits photosystem one, two electrons are released, and then the two electrons from photosystem two replace the ones lost in photosystem one. These two electrons then cause, go to, um, sorry, go to oxidized NADP. Now, what's happening here is oxidized NADP is becoming reduced NADP, which is NADPH. This happens in NADP reductase. So the electrons go into NADP reductase. You get two NADP, which is oxidized. Then that becomes to reduced NADP or NADPH. Now this occurs from hydrogen ions. That's where when H2, H2O is photolysis or photolysized, the two protons go into the NADP reductase enzyme and creates reduced NADP, which then goes off to the light independent stage. So there are two types of, now this whole process is photophosphorylation. There are two types, cyclic and non-cyclic. Non-cyclic is one I just discussed, where all that happens. You use photosystem one and two, ATP and NADPH is produced, electrons go from photosystem two to photosystem one, and photolysis occurs. In cyclic photophosphorylation, what happens is excited electrons pass to an electron acceptor but go straight back to the chlorophyll molecule from which they were lost. Now, some ATP is produced because it still goes through the thylakoid membrane slightly, so there's still small gradients, there's still some ATP produced, but not much. So, photosystem 1 only is used in cyclic, some ATP is produced, no NADPH. The electrons go straight back into photosystem one and no photolysis occurs. Now, the light independent stage. So that one just took quite a while. Now this one will as well. This is also known as the Calvin cycle. So at one, you have CO2. This is gained through the stomata. And CO2 is fixed with RUBP now it's very important in the Calvin cycle I've used the symbols here but you need to use the full name once you use the full name once you can put in brackets you know RUBP close brackets but you have to use the first na full name once RUBP is ribulose bisphosphate ribulose bisphosphate so CO2 is fixed fixated with RUBP by the enzyme Rubisco which is ribulose bisphosphate carboxylased in bracket oxygenase because it can also do that so that one you're allowed to say rubisco you don't need to say the full rib ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase but you can if you want so rubisco fixates co2 with rubp forming a six carbon compound which is unstable now this isn't actually shown in the book but it's good to know now this unstable compound immediately splits in two and becomes two three carbon compounds and that's two GP which is glycerate three phosphate. Now I'll, all the bits on the outside don't worry about just look at the mm, circular bit. Two GP becomes two TP. TP is triose phosphate. Now every two 
molecules of GP become two molecules of TP because they're both three carbon. While this happens, two molecules of NADPH two mole becomes well two molecules of NADPH become two molecules of NADP. Two ATP molecules become two ADP plus PI. Now this gives energy to the Calvin cycle. Now this is why you need the light dependent stage. For these molecules, the NADPH ATP come from the light dependent stage. Look a bit more at that in a minute. So you've now got triosphosphate. That is recycled back to RUBP, but firstly it becomes RUMP. Now RUBP is ribulose biphosphate, or bisphosphate, which probably is bisphosphate, isn't it? Um, RUMP is ribulose monophosphate, and that's five carbon. And then energy from ATP, ATP becomes ADP plus PI. Convert RUMP to RUBP, which is then goes continues in the cycle. So we now go, that's one, two, three, four, and step five, all those. Step six, actually no, go back to step two. Two GP, that can go straight to amino acids. Then step six. GP can be converted to fatty acids, which are then converted to lipids. At step four, two TP, that can also be converted to glycerol, which is then converted to lipids. TP can also go to step seven. So TP can be converted into fatty acids or fructose, which becomes glucose. Glucose can then become sucrose, which is a good transporting sugar. Cellulose, which is used in cell walls, or starch, which is used for energy storage. As you've seen in the chloroplast diagram, starch granules are there. So, a lot, now this stage is very complicated, a lot of different stuff. So basically, GP can be used to make amino acids and fatty acids. T, so you need to have two TP form together to form the six carbon sugars, that's fructose and glucose and sucrose. And then some of the TP molecules can be converted to glycerol, and this may can be converted to fatty acids formed from GP to make lipids as well. But then you've got the sugars, as we said, glucose can become starch, cellulose and sucrose. So that's the Calvin cycle. Now this slightly easier bit, this is going to be a long video, God. Limiting factors. A limiting factor is the factor that is present at the lowest or least favourable value. And there are five. Wavelength, light intensity, temperature, carbon dioxide and water. And I'll quite very quickly go through them. Wavelength of light. As we said, red and blue are absorbed, green are reflected. So, if you have a... If you have a white light and then you put a green cover over it, so only green light comes through, photosynthesis will decrease because it's not getting the favourable absorption wavelength. If you put a red or blue colour over it, so it's red or blue light, photosynthesis will increase. It's not so much as a limiting factor, but it, it is something which changes the rate of photosynthesis. Light intensity. Now, if you increase light intensity, then photosynthesis will increase until it comes to a point when you can no longer increase light intensity. Well, you can increase light intensity, but it doesn't increase the rate of photosynthesis because no more no more light energy can reduce produce electrons for magnesium. So you kind of get a traditional kind of curve which levels off. You get that with most of the graphs for limiting factors apart from temperature. So just there's light intensity. As that decreases, photosynthesis decreases because you need light. Now, one good question I will come to at the end. Have a little think about this now. Do you need light for the light independent stage to occur? I think it's a good question. Temperature. Now, temperature is an effect because of enzymes. If it's below zero degrees or above 25 degrees, enzymes will start denaturing. If you remember the proteins or enzymes video from AS, that's why I won't go into all of it now, but temperature needs to be about optimum, about 25 degrees Celsius. Between the temperatures of zero and 25 degrees, the rate of photosynthesis doubles for each 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. And that's because enzymes become more active. After 25 degrees Celsius, enzymes start denaturing. Now, Above 25, enzymes also work less efficiently 
as oxygen more successfully competes with the active site of rubisco and it's prevented from accepting co2 so that will reduce the rate of photosynthesis so temperature will have a sort of graph where it increases to 25 degrees for photosynthesis rate and then decrease after 25 degrees co2 you need carbon dioxide now the ideal carbon dioxide level is well, maximum 0.4% concentration of the air, but it's normally 0.04% in the atmosphere. Any more than 0.4% it can be dangerous to the plant. Now, this also has very similar graph to light intensity. And also water. You need a good level of water for photolysis. Limiting factors in the Calvin cycle. You need to be able to talk about how the three these three limiting factors, light intensity, carbon dioxide and temperature affect products in the Calvin cycle. So, in light intensity, bright and dim. In bright light, there's lots of RUBP and TP, not so much GP. In dim light, there's lots of GP, not so much RUBP and TP. Whenever I get a question like this, just try and think what is actually happening in the change of bright to dim light. Now, light what does that affect it affects the light dependent stage now, that's why i asked the question earlier do you need light for the light independent stage to occur yes because in the light dependent stage atp and nadph are produced and they are used in the light independent stage so yes without light the light independent stage couldn't occur because you wouldn't have ADP, atp and nadph so light so we know we must think of the products coming from the light dependent stage. Now, I told you that GP is converted to TP using ATP and NADPH. So if there's no NADPH or ATP, GP cannot be converted to TP. So GP levels will rise because it's not being converted and TP levels will fall because it's not being, it's none of it's forming from GP. Also said, TP is then recycled into RUBP. Without RUBP, you then will have, well, sorry, without any TP, no RUBP will occur, so RUBP also falls. Now, also, you'll say that RUBP is fixated with carbon dioxide, which forms GP, but think of it as it starts at one point, so it starts at the GP, so GP increases. TP then decreases, RUBP then decreases. But the GP just doesn't vanish, it stays there, so it accumulates, and that's why it rises. Carbon dioxide. Now, this one is about carbon dioxide concentration, so this one won't depend so much on the products of the light dependent stage. But you need to think what part uses CO2? That's the RUBP. So, in this case, RUBP will accumulate because it's not being fixated to GP. No GP will form, so GP decreases. No, so it won't be converted to TP, so TP decreases. And yet again, since it started with the RUBP, the RUBP won't just vanish after it's accumulated, so that's why that's high. Now with temperature. Now the temperature will have little effect upon the rate of the light-dependent reaction, apart from the photolysis of water, because it's not dependent upon enzymes. However, the light independent reaction is a series of catalyzed enzyme controlled reactions. So, as temperatures above 25 degrees, rubisco, which we, which we said could be called ri ribulose bisphosphate, and I said carboxylase, carbon dioxide, oxygenase. So, the oxygenase activity above 25 degrees increases, carboxylase well it doesn't decrease but it becomes oxygenase becomes the more has more activity in the carboxylase function so now oxygenase is used in photorespiration and carboxylase is used in photosynthesis so more photorespiration occurs in photosynthesis as a result atp and reduced nadp are dissipated and wasted and then this reduces photosynthesis. Now it's slightly more confusing, but basically rubisco becomes an oxygenase rather than a carboxylase. Respiration occurs more than photosynthesis, so you lose ATP and NADPH. Now, experimenting for 
photosynthesis. You can work out the rate of photosynthesis using, well, this apparatus. There's a photosynthometer and Aldus microburette. Makes a lot of sense. So, what I'll explain the actual what happens first. So, fill the apparatus with tap water because you want no air bubbles like with transpiration. And allow a gentle stream of tap water into the barrel of the syringe until the whole barrel and plastic tube are full of water and then make sure there's no air bubbles. Cut a piece of well illuminated plant, it can be anyone, it could be pondweed in this case they talk about in the book, and make sure the bubbles of gas emerging from, there are bubbles of gas emerging from the cut stem. Place this cut end ups, upwards into a test tube, so the stem is facing upwards, containing the same water, the pot, well in this case pondweed has been kept in, and add some drops of hydrogen carbonate solution, now this produces carbon dioxide. Stand the test tube in a beaker of water at about 20 degrees. Use the thermometer to measure the temperature. Place a light source. Measure the distance from the pondweed. And you can work out then light intensity as light intensity equals 1 over d squared, which is distance. Leave the apparatus with a capillary tube, which is a little bendy bit. Position so that it's not collecting gas given off by the plant for 5 to 10 minutes, so it acclimatizes. Then position the capillary tube over the cut end of the plant. Reposition the capillary tube to collect more gas from the plant and repeat step four twice. This is now step four is the important one. That is when you want to collect bubbles of gas. Read and note the length of the bubble along the tube, along the ruler. And you can then gently push the plunger so the bubble is expelled. That's a little syringe. So push the syringe in, the bubble will go back in and then just vanish. We don't want the bubble anymore. Now, once you've got the length of the bubble, you times that by pi r, the radius of the capillary tube, squared, and you've got the volume of gas. And now, what you can do is you can you have to control temperature, use a water bath or something. You've got a thermometer to detect. Wet light wavelength, so what you want to do then is make the room black and shine one light source on it of white light. Carbon dioxide, you've got the sodium hydrocarbonate. That's the hardest to control and light intensity, that's how far away it is. Now, you can change any one of these. In this case, they're talking about changing the light intensity. You can change temperature by having it in different temperature water baths, anything like that. And after this monumentally long video, we are done. So, conclusion, photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water becomes glucose plus oxygen. You have Two steps in photosynthesis, the light dependent, which uses light, light independent, the Calvin cycle. This occurs in chloroplasts. There are many limiting factors of photosynthesis, light, temperature, CO2 concentration, wavelength, and water, well, water volume. And then you can measure photosynthesis using a photosynthometer and Aldis microburette. Now this is a very complicated topic, so please message me if you want any help on any bits or want me to clarify something. But it's really important you get those two stages learnt. They are hard. So thank you for watching and goodbye.